So again, the title is Language and Decolonizing the African Tongue. Uh, so yes. I am, yeah, I'm gonna do that. It's, it's actually been, I put it all in here. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So the, a uh, little bit about me. Uh, let, me well, let me go, I'm sorry. Language Decolonizing the African Tongue. The subtitle is Language of the Contested Terrain of African Consciousness. And I'll, I'll unpack that, this idea of contested terrain. So who am I? I'm a uh, associate professor of educational foundations at Nicolay National University. Uh, I was in the Department of Education by this thing, but we don't have a department now, but I'm still the team. I'm a member of the education, uh, member and education committee chair for the Comedic Institute here in this building. Uh, I'm also the, a member and the education commission chair for the, so, uh, for the Midwest region, the Association of Facility of Classical African Civilization, just at our uh, international conference last weekend in Philadelphia. I'm one of the co-founders and one of the coordinators for Aqua Women Rights and Passage Society. This is the Rights and Passage Society we put together. Me and um, and three uh, other uh, men uh, came together to create the Rights and Passage Society. Our sons and other youth who we felt needed to be affected to socialize and anger. Um, and we just had a, a ceremony last weekend, a lot going on last weekend. Uh, to uh, move the brothers up that first phase, the brothers up the phase team program to recognize their brilliant achievement studies. Uh, I'm also a graduate uh, from the uh, Institute Studies program. I finished up in 2010. And this program has been really, really hopeful uh, in terms of giving me a ground, uh, especially when I was in graduate school. And it's, it's also set the trajectory for my work in the present. And then lastly, I'm a graduate from Department of Educational Policy Studies at U of I, uh, I finished up there in 2009. I wrote my decision about the boys and uh, had some work about the boys and this, that should be coming out soon. So, so beyond that, uh, because the middle was language, and I thought it might be appropriate to talk about where I'm coming from in terms of language studies. Uh, so I began, I studied uh, Key Swahili in undergrad. I actually studied four semesters of Key Swahili in undergrad. Uh, and the U of I at that time, I want to say they were four African languages which were available, were available. Kiswahili, Wola, Amana, and uh, Lingala, I think before they may have been, oh yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I think one of the Inguni languages was available too. Uh, I don't know, maybe, again, I've been trying to figure out, I've been trying to recall what, why Kiswahili, and I haven't satisfactorily unpacked that, but I think I had this sense that it was a language that had some meaning among black folks in America, so anyway, I started studying it there, uh, back in the late 90s, I taught it, the late 90s, early 2000s, I uh, taught it, yes, not in the end of the early 2000s, I taught it at the Shuley Awatoto Rice Passage Academy. I mean, if you know the Shuley Awatoto was the school founded by Baba Hannibal Freak in the, in the 90s, uh, after the school shut down to full time school. Uh, they operated as a, as a Saturday school, the Rice Passage program, so I taught some basic things right here there. Uh, I've continued to study it. Uh, most recently, you told me back in the early 2000s, I started studying Metronetra. These two languages, Kiswa Hilly and Metronetra, have a prominent role in this particular paper, and I'll unpack that a little bit. So uh, I work with Professor Von Jones here for two classes with her. Uh, last fall, we had a conference. We had a metal nature conference, and uh, I'll talk about the significance of that a little bit. Uh, the, actually, the title of the conference was Hidden Pursuit of Metal Nature, which means the, the repetition of the rebirth of metal nature. Uh, and I've also studied a few other African languages. I, I took a, a tree class back in the mid-2000s, and, and since then, uh, I've dabbled a little bit in uh, various African languages, uh, and interestingly for various reasons. But the point is that I've been motivated by not only this is intellectual curiosity, but also this idea that there's a question that to what extent are these languages connected with this process of a central fund, this process of re-Africanization that African people in this country have been engaged in for decades. So this is the flyer for the Metronetric Conference. Again, it was October 6th to 8th. Uh, the 6th and 7th were here in this building. The, the 8th we were on at Black United Fund on 71st Street. Um, the purpose of the conference uh, was the revitalization of metal nature, um, the resurrection of the, the development of the language for our use, not only in our scholarly work, but in our daily lives. And then I'll get into what spurred that. So I start off, uh, get, I want to get into the paper. And, and one of the things I, I make, one of the points that I make in here, I have to find a more clever way to move back and forth between these two. One of the, the things that I, um, argue in the paper is that one of the things that's been sufficient in our liberation movements is that our conceptualization 
of independence is not fully interrogated the culture. Uh, which is why I want these flags. Because I think that our, we have been, I think, fairly adept at invoking the symbolism of sovereignty, but the actualization of sovereignty continues to elude us. I have these very disturbing moments. Uh, over the last month, I've been on the internet, on uh, social media, and I've seen these protests. Uh, a couple of scenes that have happened in Chicago, where I've seen people walking around holding the, 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 the UNIA flag, the red, black, and gray flag, with integrationists. I've even seen a couple of white folks holding the flag, <laughs> uh, which, which, which is a pretty profound statement in and of itself, right? Because I, what, what occurs to me is that we, both us here, but also us on the continent, invoke these symbols, these the flags, these symbols which represent territorial sovereignty. That's what the flag is uh, But in fact, we don't have territorial sovereignty. Uh, we are, in fact, postrated uh, before the lords of global capitalism. So on one side, I have these, these images of flags, the Ghana flag, this is the South African flag, this is Angola, this is Senegal, this is Tanzania. Um, and then I have some images of the, uh, what our prostration before the lords of capitalism is reduced in daily life. This top image is from, anybody know what this is? Recognize this? This is Kibera. Kibera is, uh, for lack of a better term, a slum outside of Nairobi in Kenya. It has a mm -hmm. population of about two and a half million people. Uh, and Kibera, I think in many ways, exemplifies what what has happened to us in the absence of us having control over our lives, control over our own affairs, being the stewards of that our destiny. And the second image is uh, another slum. This is outside of Accra. This is actually a, um, an electronic waste dump. Uh, so, so much of your electronic waste, so you throw away those old TVs, you have an old VCR that you toss, that a lot of that stuff ends up on ships, and a lot of it ends up in Africa and other countries like that. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, Africa and other places like that. <coughs> one of those countries. countries. Uh, so just, again, just outside of Accra, you have this dump um, where you have electronic waste. Interestingly enough, people will mine this waste. Yeah. So some people go in there, they'll find, you know, uh, minerals and metals which are valuable. They'll sell, they'll sell those things. Um, there's some people there. There have been also reports of people actually living in these places, uh, but but it's, but it's dangerous. It's not safe. Not, not a healthy environment to live. So, so I offer that uh, image just as a way of capturing what what we have done. You know, Carter, you whistle one of the things that he says in the Miseducation of the Negro, which I really enjoy. There's a whole chapter called "How We Missed the Mark." You know, I mean, you could you could actually have a whole lecture just on the titles of these chapters, "How We Missed the Mark." And I think part of the the problem beyond the economic, obviously, economic contradictions and obviously the political malformations which this represents, argue that at the core of all of this. At the core of our insufficient conceptualization of the political and economic is the cultural, language, which is why I argue, uh, which is why I want to talk about this idea of language and how language uh, may be significant. So, again, two more images. Um, the um, one of the points that Dr. Carruthers talks about, in fact, this is something I say in the paper, says that our, our conceptualization of liberation is I sufficiently interrogated the need for both. Paradigms and processes of re-Africanization re is notable and problematic. Indeed, while liberation has often been limited to discourses pertaining to the state and the economy, the cultural matrix of a people necessarily dictates the trajectory of their movement and development. Therefore, when, when Dr. Carruthers, when Jacob H. Carruthers uh, states that, quote, the process of Africanization and transformation cannot be separated neatly into two stages, they overlap, end quote, he is referring to the necessity of an interweaving of the ostensibly political, economic, and cultural, cultural as the political and economic are expressions of culture. They too must reflect the concretization of, people, of a people's worldview, uh, that is, quote, the way uh, people conceive of the fundamental questions of existence and the organization of the universe, end quote. Thus, the liberation struggle is an escapable a cultural struggle. So I offer this image uh, as, again, another juxtaposition. Uh, this is uh, the African Union. Yeah, yeah, built by China. Built by China. <laughs> Look, listening devices. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, this is, I think this is Jeanette, Mali. One of the cities, one of the classic cities of the Mali Empire. Go back. <laughs> yeah, go back. I go back. Go back. Go back. But, but, I, but I juxtapose these because one of the tensions that many people argue that we are situated in, in fact, my uh, 
Balaji and Kosovo were coming to this uh, a struggle between tradition and modernity. And, 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 and to be sure, they make the elements of this, but, but ultimately, they are many of us who are caught up in the trappings of development, the trappings of progress, the trappings of, of statehood, when in fact we feel it actualized. And the, the sad tragedy that we have to confront is that in many instances, our ancestors, the people that built this place, are actually more free than any African person on earth is today. And, and so, this idea of the questions as to whether or not our culture can inform how we conceptualize the future, how we go forth into the future, argues is, is vital. Um, so, this is the quote, that what I, which I just read in, in the picture of uh, Dr. Grothers. So I'll keep it moving. Um, so one of the things that, that has been problematic when we look at this, uh, we find that one might argue, and many people have talked about this, Armaz talked about this, that there's a language problem. And we have a language problem. In fact, Armaz published an essay called Our Language Problem. It's been reprinted on and but what I say here is that the adoption of peace in East Africa notwithstanding, European language is the language of the conquerors of slave and stabilized the manner of language, of government, and other major institutions such as schools and nearly every level. Argue that there's really no separation between this idea that our conception of political development, our conception of economic development is inextricably linked to the Western model. And I argue that at the core of our dependence on the Western model are inextricably linked to our uh, connect to our dependence on the Western model. Our failure to rely upon our own, to draw from our own. I'm arguing that language is actually essential. We're not simply talking about how we communicate with people, because that's sort of the, the most basic function, the most basic of the is. But we're also talking about the, our, how language enables us to conceive of reality, to think in a meaningful, valuable, and also even way. Uh, to argue that there's a connection between our dependence upon our enemy's vision of reality, our enemy's vision of the future. And our failure to actualize the vision of our future. And I think that in many ways, our dependence upon the human language, our dependence upon the parents, and all these things are One of the first stages in that is for us to recapture our minds, to reclaim our culture, and then language is the foundation of that. This is, uh, this is an example of this. This is uh, from the website of the Mozambique, uh, Mozambique Parliament. Uh, anybody tell what language is in? Yeah, yeah, it's in Portuguese. No, no language from Mozambique. That's the point. That's the point. That's the point. Um, and, and this is, you know, many people have written about this. Um, many people have written about this. All right, check out the joke in uh, his book on Black Africa, his book titled Black Africa. Armand talked about this in his essay. Joke argued that one of the problems, one of the tragedies of this dependence on European language is that one, it moves us to that paradigm. Two, it moves us to that interest. Three, if you look at the levels of saturation of, of European languages in any African country, what we find is that it's really a minority of the population that speaks the form of European language. Uh, and then usually that's limited to the capital, and that's usually limited to the elite, uh, and or people have to deal with the elite, you know, and, and so on. Uh, which means that the job, our, our, the job's argument essentially was that this bars many people who otherwise would participate in the process of governance, but who are unable to because they lack fluency in the colonial language. And so this is this, this that we have this pattern. This, this pattern persists. It's fascinating. Again, you know, East Africa notwithstanding, uh, in all of almost the entirety of the continent, we are hopelessly, seemingly dependent upon uh, the enemy's languages. So the um, this this language problem isn't just over there, but it's also over here. And in fact, I argue that in many ways that language problem, which was argues, is again linked to this. The, the, uh, the impoverishment of our imaginations on the continent. Because again, languages are tethers. Many of the scholars would argue they are tethers to the world we frame or community with the culture. And so that we remain dependent upon the world, that the, upon the European worldview as our basic framework by which we imagine our future. I would argue that that level of impoverishment that exists there is magnified. Uh, and so this is notable, I think, in many ways. And in fact, when I say, I'll read this and unpack this a little bit. That this language problem exists not only in Africa but also in the African diaspora, where the primary languages of most Africans are the languages of their ancestors, captives, and tormentors. It's notable that even our discourse pertaining to liberation must be mediated in the languages of those historically opposed to those ends, thus begging the question of how the inescapable epistemological vectors of language determines the conceptualization of liberation as both an ontological and a political We talk about epistemological vectors. 
think about vectors as the directions in which something is moving with momentum, with energy. The idea is that our thinking about the future is moving in a particular direction. Our concept of the future of the world, our concept of the future of African people is moving in a certain direction, and that direction is determined in European terms. It's populated by European energy. It's determined by where we see white folks going, essentially. Um, and then when we talk about the ontological, we're talking about, again, our beliefs about the very nature of reality. I want to unpack this and give you some examples. It's just a, I just wanted to, like, for uh, Kind of Africans that have come here to live in this country mm -hmm. or in other Western countries, mm -hmm. you know, even though they speak their native language, at a point in which I've encountered with them, they said that they, they wind up, see, initially when they came to these countries, they were thinking their own language. Mm -hmm. But after a while, they started thinking yeah. their language in the yeah. countries that they go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is interesting to, to that point, I have, uh, I teach part time in the community college in the south suburb. And every semester, I have uh, several students who are continental Africans in my class, either who are more students who were born here or first generation students, right? First and second generation students. And uh, I have this one, I have one this semester. We, we looked at a, a little clip from a film called Language Matters, Bob Holman, who's broadcast on PBS a few years back. Looks at several things, but essentially raises the question of why languages matter in terms of the culture. I, my, it's three parts. The first part deals with the death of, native, of the indigenous language in Australia. The second part deals with the Welsh language uh, in, in the UK. The third part deals with the native Hawaiian language. And so, oh, now that's my favorite part because these cats were very nationalistic. They understood that in order to be themselves, they had to embrace their language. They saw no separation. Whereas we have this idea we can speak English and be African. Uh, we speak it in the colonial language, and thus our in, independence of this language mediates our representation and perception of reality. They got that, right? And so even though most of them still speak English in the dependent upon it, they've been engaged in serious efforts in the 1980s to the language. But anyway, I showed a little excerpt from this film and I had a student in the class and she came up to me afterwards and she explained her malaise that her parents are from Nigeria. And so she understands Yoruba, because they're Yoruba, but she can't speak it. She understands it, but she can't, but she can't speak it. But her youngest siblings can't even understand it. And so it's very fascinating, right? Uh, because it was, I, was, I think I was at a, one of Baba Hannibal's in Kansas. This is one where uh, Mama Marimba and he was in, the daughter Jifu was in. It seems like this came up. And I think it was Jifu who said this, that the longer we're in the northern cradle, the more we become like the people of the northern cradle. If you go up to Dia, go back to Dia, too. Uh, but so again, that, that phenomenon I think is real because there is no incentive. There is no incentive for doing anything African in this environment, right? When you think about the rewards that are built into the structure of the society, the Africanization is rewarded, right? And Westernization is rewarded. Uh, and, so, um, and so this idea that we see this particular pattern, I think is unsurprising because we're not in African space. We're in space where Africanness is problematized with everyone. Yes, sir. Yeah. But for immigrants, mm -hmm. by the time that they're in the third generation, they are pretty much, I mean, that's a statistical, statistical piece. Right. They've forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've forgotten their traditional language of families unless their grandchildren who have been around their grandparents who've spoken it consistently. But even with that, they'll understand it, mm -hmm. but they may not be able to speak it mm -hmm. on one hand. But then on the other hand, by the third generation, they've forgotten that mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and they go strictly with English, which continues the separation between them right. and their grandparents. So, I mean, it's, it's just, here's the point I think we, we and you're saying it, mm -hmm. when you institutionalize something within the culture and embed right. it in the culture, right. whoever comes through that culture, exactly. they get it. they're they going to get it. They get it. So they're going to act it out. Right. And the only, only way that you produce a counterbalance to that mm -hmm. is to have institutions that demand you deal with the traditions right. of the cultures that you've come from. And so those same immigrants mm -hmm. that go to cultural events, usually mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. their church or their mm -hmm. religious practice, they meet other people, right. and it demands that you got to be able to speak the language. Right. So that's all I'm saying. And, and uh, to your point, you know, it's interesting because what, what you find with many of these communities, they represent the deficit. They represent the we recognize the deficit, the loss that's right. of a particular cultural mooring. Uh, we were at, my wife and I went to an event a few years ago uh, by uh, the Igbo community here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to me listening to them lament the fact that many of the young people can't speak the language. 
so they recognize that there's a disconnect in the very, the, 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 the very need, being, the very nature of being colonized by English, the, the very dependence upon English, uh, necessities of the formation and, and maintenance of the type of generation discontinuity that disconnects people from their tradition, their culture, their worldview, and ultimately their, their tradition. Just give me an example of not speaking the natural culture, but speaking in alien cultures. Mm -hmm. Language. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the my issues, and so like, I argue that even 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 for for the Eastern Africa, I defend it one English. I think that's implication in terms of how we conceptualize reality. If you take uh, this word, yeah. if you take this word, and for the people, you know, if you take the word freedom, what does that mean? <laughs> what does freedom mean? This is slavery. The opposite of slavery. Anybody else? What does it mean? The ability to self actualize. Self actualize. You heard him. Gordo. Gordo. I was going to say uh, sovereignty. Sovereignty. Ability to control your environment and control yourself. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. I think that is said it. Uh -huh. I asked this question because. Exactly. And I appreciate that, right? Because I have observed, and I'm sure you all have as well, there are certain people you can go to in our community and you'd ask them what this means, and they would say things which they might say things what we would call hyper relevant. Like freedom is the ability for me to dye my hair silver. Uh, and I don't mean like it because it's turning gray anyway, but like to dye my hair my hair silver and uh, do one myself with right, you know, the do, do weird stuff, you know, or that the freedom is hyper relevant, the ability for me to deviate from any cultural norms to release any hold that they have on me. Do whatever I desire to whatever extent I am capable, right? But some people that's their definition too. <coughs> some people that's hyper relativism. So, so, kind of, so I would argue that conceptions of freedom are inextricably bound up in a particular worldview matrix, right? Because we live in a society where the culture of mass consumption has so colonized our consciousness. Many of our people, those who haven't been politicized, they see freedom as little more than the ability for them to do whatever they want to do to excess, right? Well, those of us who have been politicized, of course, we may see freedom as being something very specific, right? We may see freedom as the very thing that, as some of you all mentioned, our ability to exercise sovereignty, our ability to control our collective destiny. My point is that within the context of the language, within the context of the culture in which we are situated in, this word can contain all of those meanings. I would argue that's somewhat different than if we were to say this, uh, or, which is Uhuru, or if we were to say, say this, which is for Um The uh, Uhuru, of course, the Kichwahili word for freedom. The root of this word is to release, to release, uh, to let go. Hence to be unshackled, unfettered, we said that, yeah. That's that's literally what, what that what that connects to. So if the so whenever you see you in front of a piece right in the eye, that makes it abstract. You know, so the, the possibility, the reality of being unfed, right? Being unrestrained. Which is why this term became popular not just among us, but among folks on the other side of the world, who will stop saying freedom now, you know, this being unfettered now. But when he um that the the way of body there, I think the whole thing. Input. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. BB for Hulie, it should be one word, I put too much space in a BB for Hulie, which is, for Hulie, it's also free, freedom, a BB for Hulie is African freedom, African liberation, it's just a tweet of a word. But the point is that for Hulie also refers to a similar thing, being unfettered, unrestrained, yes sir. That doesn't mean that those languages don't have words that encompass everything that Said here in the definition of freedom and that and the conceptualization. So the, my point is that within the context of these cultures, freedom has been conceptual or, or Uhuru rather, right? Has been conceptualized to mean very specific things and not mean other things. But what he has been conceptualized to mean certain things but not other I would argue in neither of those societies either of these terms refer to hyper That you can do whatever you want to do without any constraint. But I would argue that meaning, that potential meaning is contained within this work because of the very nature of the reality. Honestly. But yeah. but also in that language format, mm -hmm. there's a philosophy mm -hmm. that gives even deeper detail 
to what those words mean. Right, right, right. Because the word is a cultural representation of a whole body of cultural principles right. and concepts right. and ideals that the word represents. Mm -hmm. And so once you get into the word, mm -hmm. you have dialogue and discussion and debate right. over the concepts and the principles that are behind the representation of that word. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So when you buy into the language, you buy into that whole body of other things that are represented that by are word. Me, so right. the word or the language just doesn't represent itself. Mm -hmm. It represents a body of thought and notions of realities that are behind it. Right, right, right. So, so again, this is part of the point is that ultimately, this is something that Sabah Rikini says, that we'll, you'll have a quote by Randy, but I'll get into this. So while liberation is not merely a matter of language, I argue that liberation is still very much a political and economic reality, but that language is linked to worldview, and this ultimately expresses the people's total way of seeing the world, their total way of being in the world. Sabah Rikini Yaman says that, well, since most of our conscious modes of conceptualizing, acting, and moving about are conditioned in part by our language, to use the language of another culture, to use that culture's ideas, to use another culture's ideas in place of one's own, is to relegate the latter to a position of exact inferiority. And so for me, part of the question becomes, what are the implications of us conceptualizing our project within the context, of, not just of African terms, but within the context of African ontologies, you know, African beliefs, by the very nature of the average, and I'll unpack what the implications of that uh, may be in a moment. So, one of the uh, so one of the what I'm going to want to do with this presentation mainly over the next 55 minutes <laughs> is to explore just briefly the history of Pan African language proposals. There have been a number of proposals that have been made since the 1960s around this idea of a Pan African language. So I'm talking about African languages specifically in service of the project of Pan African. So that means that certain, there's a certain orientation to the discussion of what frame that now. Um, and so I'll look at, uh, at different proposals. You know, one proposal has been the Kishwai Hilishi, the Soul Pan African language. That's probably the one that's the most popular that may have the most history. Others have proposed that we should have regional Pan African languages. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you have others who have argued that we should, in fact, revitalize uh, the ancient uh, Kemetic language. And this, this is something that came up. Uh, conversation that I have with Sabah Rikiriyama. And you also have people say that we should construct a language. We should, we should create an African language, which is also in our capacity. So this paper will consider not only these proposals in the abstract, but also the implications for what Dr. Anderson Thompson referred to as us having a grand vision of the future, the destiny of African people. Because I argue, again, language has some potential in terms of enabling us to envision that. Um, and, and that because they move us beyond, again, the conceptual frontiers of European language and the, the constraints that these place on our consciousness. So again, uh, I want to go back to our minds, the title of this paper, Our Language Problem, and, uh, and unpack the problem a little bit more. Um, so in, this, in, our, in the essay, two points that he raised in the essay that uh, I thought were meaningful. He argued that for the most part, Africans were dependent upon Europeans for disseminating literature. And so he's talking about, on one hand, the essay is dealing with the Malays of African writers that they are producing works primarily in the colonial language, publishing primarily through Europeans, you know, through, like, through the colonial, <laughs> the public colonizers, publishers. So I, so I put this, you know, and I got, you know, tease this one out because we can put a lot of folks' works up there, but as an example, as a case in point. So. Uh, Tim Enzo, you know, he had written a couple books in reference to you know, about how this, you know. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and one of the, one of the obvious constraints here is that when Europeans are the mediators of our intellectual enterprise, essentially the gatekeepers of our intellectual enterprise, they have the capacity to control what ideas and what information people are exposed to, what ideas they are not. And, 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 but also, by, by this is more of truth, this is more applicable for folks on the continent than perhaps us here, but by the primary mode of literary production being the colonial language, mm -hmm. feeds into a legitimized psychologization. <laughs> One, one of the things that happened at the Metal Metric Conference, which is very interesting, is that uh, Brother Obadele Kanban presented uh, from Ghana. He stays in Ghana, he teaches at the University of Ghana, Tehran. He did his presentation in the Shanti Chui. Uh, so he did, presented in Chui and then he would translate the Chui into English. And uh, he said that one of the concerns that he has is that whereas we are advocating people learning 
uh, in this case, the meta metric which is the language of ancient Kemet, you argue that part of the problem is that because most of the, li li the materials are in English or French or German, you know, we would then, if we were saying, taking on the challenges of disseminating this language throughout Africa, you know, are we going to then show up to different parts of Africa and say, well, you need to learn the colonial language so we can teach you this, rather than teaching it directly from that in, the, in whatever the African language in question is. So in his situation, since he's teaching at the university, he's dealing with Shanti and Chui speakers, as well as people who speak other African languages, and using the African languages as a medium of, of teaching this language, which is a very interesting approach. Um, the point is that what he's attempting to do from a pedagogical standpoint is to remove that business when just using English or French or German or whatever it may be as a mediator of African thought. And our mod argues in this essay that essentially our dependence upon these folks' languages, just even to write works, is also one of those te uh, te tethers of dependency. And this is off from the website of the, uh, from the African Union. Um, again, I showed you, you know, the, the parliamentary uh, assembly hall uh, earlier, but this is a uh, from the Constitutive Act of the African Union, and this is Article Number 25 on working languages. It says, quote, the working languages of the African Union and all its institutions shall be, if possible, African languages, Arabic, <coughs> English, French, and Portuguese. It's a very interesting statement. <laughs> if possible. If possible. If possible. We can learn a lot about who has power in the world by Reading that like that. Yes. Uh, we learn a lot about who has power and who has and who does that power. Yeah. I, I just want to. Uh, well, oh, no. I, I just want to affirm what you're saying. You know, uh, what's the guy who's the president? Uh, Macron. Macron. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He's decided that they have to advance. French speaking mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. place That's right. so that they can be a world power. That's right. Now, I mean, this is something that he's getting all the people in government mm -hmm. to figure out how can we advance French mm -hmm. really to replace English, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. as a force in the world. So, you know, that's kind of what you, yeah, and if you see, that's about power. And if you look at the, the demography, what they're saying is that by the middle of the century, and he started with Africa. Africa. Vast majority of French speakers will be in Africa. Yes, they talk about in Ghana making French a required language in secondary school for to facilitate greater regional integration. And again, yeah. regional integration is a good thing. It doesn't have to be on the terms of the colonizers' language. Because again, one might argue, and this is Diop's argument, that these are tethers of dependence. Well, we have that that's that's the intellectual problem mm -hmm. that we have to figure out mm -hmm. how to deal with that mm -hmm. and deal with it in a way that is politically acceptable. Right. Among the elites, right? I prefer again, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of the problems with French is that they've complained for the last fifty years that American English mm -hmm. has begun to corrupt mm -hmm. French. Mm -hmm. You know, especially mm -hmm. when you look at the popular culture. But I'm very upset about it. And and of course, the other thing is that the elite around the world speak. English, because English is the language of commerce and business. Quotes, that's right. And science. And science. <laughs> so that's a problem. I mean, I when know. when you read uh, Putin, Putin came out with a clear statement saying that they, the Russians, have had enough mm. of Anglo-Saxons mm -hmm. running the world. Mm. Okay, and that his agenda is to change that. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, they're all white folks at the end of the day, but I'm just telling you, that white folk <laughs> said this is what he felt. The French white folk said what they said. I mean, look, we have to be real. We can't get caught up in those artificial, those battles that they have, but we need to understand that they have a dissension among themselves, except when it comes to us. When it's right. us, they cool. Everybody right. understands what their role is. It's like, slow your roll when it comes to black <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm can. Sorry. Yes, sir. Earlier, I was going to say, prior to like 20 years ago, uh -huh. French was the official second language of America. Yeah. It was taught in all the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. languages. Yeah. Until you know, we had this uh, Hispanic invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, secondly, um, back to this statement we have on the UN and yeah. on the African Union. Uh -huh. 
uh, that was a, that was a uh, statement at the Southern Pan African Congress that it was almost derailed by the Arabs because they didn't want to translate at the Pan African Congress, and so they was going to just cut, just stop the whole conference, you know, because we were so dependent on the Arabs translating. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to translate some type of thing like that. This just shows you how. Yeah. Use a language can derail your entire liberation effort. Exactly. 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 So you know, again, this is you know, and, and to Diop, you know, well, I mean, again, Arma, uh, his 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 point was that these languages are tools of dependency, and ultimately, his argument was that essentially what needed to happen is that we needed to uh, embrace a Pan African language, uh, some form or another. One of the things that was very interesting in his essay, he uh, he, he didn't get into into particulars. He he, he, had to say, he argued that. Really, Keith Swahili and Mellon Nature probably might be the best candidate, Keith Swahili in particular. Uh, but, but the point is that the, the lack of resolve on our part to eliminate our dependency upon these people's languages we see today, and this comes at great economic cost. It comes at great economic cost. So, so that's our mind. Diop, you know, Diop talks about this. You know, one of the points that Diop makes in, uh, in uh, Black Africa, he, he makes a number of points, but one of those I made earlier that by requiring, by making the European languages, the former colonial language, the language of governance, in effect, you are limiting the range of people who are able to participate in the political process. These are just some basic statistics uh, of the proportion of French speakers in the four select West African countries. So we have Senegal, where it's estimated that 28% of the population speaks French, Cote d'Ivoire, where it's estimated that 34% of the population speaks French, Benin, where it's 35%, Mali, where it's 20%. It's very interesting, isn't it? And they act French, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and that's, who is this? <laughs> right. Yeah. And it makes other people that are not in want to learn. Exactly, it inspired it. I, have, uh, I was reading an article, and I cite the article in the paper uh, by a brother named um, um, Ubozi, I think. Uh, and it was, it was an article dealing with Kiswahili as an international language. And, he, and I knew about this before I read the article, but it was just so refreshing to read it. That right now in Tanzania, the tension is around the elite wanting their children to speak English. Because, again, as you know, Tanzania was the first African country after it decolonized to make an African language the national language. And, and that, that was great. <laughs> you know, Pan Africanism is great until it's time to bow down to the lords of global, global capitalism. And so now they're dealing with this, this phenomenon where the elite of the society, they're putting their children in private English language schools because they want them to be English. Uh, and so inevitably, our lack of economic power brings us back, you know, to, to you know, I, I, I so, you know, one of the, so yeah, you know, that's one of his points. He says that, you know, first of all, we have to deal with the question of governance. We have to deal with the question of the masses of people being able to participate in the political process. And if we make the language of government, we make the language of the political process, the colonial language, by its very nature, we will eliminate the range of people who are able to participate. He argued that they're therefore dependence upon these languages and institutionalized them is inherently discriminatory. In the 50s and early 60s, Germany was taught. Mm -hmm. You know, was the elimination of that in the schools a further punishment of the Germans for their involvement in World War II? I know that happened. I know it was punishment for them back in the uh, 19 teens. The 50s, I don't know about. But I know in the 19 teens, there were, in Chicago, in fact, they were burning German language textbooks in school, uh, outside of school. So I know in the 19 teens, it happened. In the 50s, I'm not so sure. Well, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, speaking of Gary, my cousin learned German. Yeah. And, uh, at Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and he went on to Fisk to something that he also studied. <clears throat> huh. Interesting you mentioned that too, because I briefly went to school in Hammond, Indiana. And when I was out there, I'm sorry. They had German, they offered German. And I thought that was so interesting because all of when I was in CBS and everybody I knew who went to CBS, it was French, Spanish, and, and we had Latin. Yeah. You know, but German was, was not present there, but it was present in Indiana, which is kind of interesting. The other critique that, that Diop raises, he argues that many Africans would argue that when we look at this, when we look at this dependence upon French or Portuguese and English, that in fact is a matter of expediency. 
Because as we said earlier, what is the language of science, right? What is the language of commerce? In the early 20th century, French was the language of diplomacy. And so many people would argue that our very dependence upon these languages is actually a matter of necessity. He argued that even if that were the case, even if it was expedient, even if it is expedient, that we should eventually wean ourselves off these languages, that we have to begin to use our languages, that we have to again rely upon ourselves and our own potential capacity as African people. And so he raises the question, and this is one of the ideas that runs throughout the essay, you know, do Pan-African languages, are they up to the task, right? Um, and, and, you know, to prove that, to deal with that challenge, he himself, he translated, uh, he started translating these various European texts, scientific and literary, into Wolof to demonstrate this. Um, and, and, and again, just as an aside, I, I threw up a couple of words here, you know, different terms, either you know, science or, or some aspect of society. You know, things that, that, that we can convey in African languages, right? So we have Ufutan, uh, Ufutan is a Kishwahili word related to uh, gravity. Yes, sir. I, I just want to throw this one thing out. See, it's a power principle, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we got to keep that in mind. Yep. The world just didn't deal with English. Right. Go back to Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. Go 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 back to Alexander the Great. The, the Alexander the, the youngster <laughs> when he supposedly <laughs> conquered the white world. Right. Okay. What became the standard? If right. you were educated, yeah. right. you right. had to know what? Exactly. Greek. Exactly. The Romans come along. Mm -hmm. They all over the world. Yep. If you wanted to be in power and do business, then you needed to know what? Latin. Okay, and then it was taught in the institutional places, schools, churches. It's embedded in all the cultures, and particularly among the elites. So then the when the French come into power, mm -hmm. the language of culture, and this was under the Napoleonic pieces, mm -hmm. the Napoleonic era, is French, Francais. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, when the Germans have power, this Ger and, and all these languages of power are embedded in the institutions, yeah. and they made standards. I mean, at one point, if you were considered educated, you had to know that. You had to know German. You had to know Greek. So, I mean, as African people to sit up and say that eventually we'd be weaned off, it doesn't talk about intention. And the intention is, is that we're clear yes. that we don't need this because it does not allow people to participate in our system. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing mm -hmm. that many of the elites don't want. Exactly. Okay, because right. if they had it, it would be much more unpredictable. And then the people might right. say, later for y'all. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So and it's that's a power. Like, it's a power principle. And that's interesting because there's a, I remember looking at Democracy now, back in the late 2000s, and they were talking about voter suppression in America, and they were arguing that part of the, the part of the, the intelligence behind voter suppression is to constrain the, the size and composition of the electorate. That's right. And any radical enlargement of the electorate could throw into question the outcome of any given electoral contest. That's right. You know, <coughs> lose a by an elect, some some radical, some revolutionary, you know. Exactly. And so oh, this gosh. idea of constraining who's able to participate builds, uh, builds into the system a certain degree of predictability. Well, Trump. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, again, you know, I, so I, you know, Jupp's argument is that, you know, we, we dependent upon these languages. We actually need to transition to using our languages because this becomes both the signifier as well as the means of us reconceptualizing who we are and what we attempt to do to concretize in the world. Um, so, so we argue that, well, as I said, it's already, this is, uh, in a, this is actually from the, the guy, uh, Mugukozi. He says that, uh, quote, certainly the French, Britons, and Portuguese would do everything in their power to ensure that their languages remain dominant. The language for them is a political, economic, and strategic question. There it is. And this is what we do. That's about. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, on that little question, mm -hmm. right, that uh, job raised in. Close and mm -hmm. In South Africa, mm -hmm. while folks are talking about the land question of mm -hmm. extracting land, there's something else going on, which this book talks about. Mm -hmm. It's called Mutu and the Law. Mm -hmm. They're using indigenous South African linguistic ideas mm -hmm. throughout all the law. Mm -hmm. I would strongly recommend. 
you get this piece. Yes, yes, yes. Can you turn you can around here and also yeah. retranslate oh, okay. uh, it to the If you look at some right. of the studies in, in, in London around the school too, it doesn't mean what yeah. uh, I'm trying to do about before you. Right. Yeah. So they're they're bad trying to bring really that. Sorry. Yeah. Right. This, that's right. This, they're using specific indigenous social in the belly mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and so Zulu ideas from in the law. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a whole different idea of our story of justice and so forth. And I appreciate that you said that there's a um, I was watching a, a lecture by Linda um, Tuku I Smith, who's a Maori South. As you as you as many of you know, you know, the Maori much like many indigenous communities have been actively engaged in this campaign Absolutely. to reclaim their land. That's right. One of the things that she said <coughs> happened. She said that in the beginning, it was really very simply about reclaiming the land as a tool of restoring and re re fortifying their identity. And they really got in it. But people got in it. Then they saw it's more than that. They saw it's more than that. So one of the things she said that in fact she was a part of that group, a small group of people that went to a British musician from the British village in London. They were looking at a sail that had been taken from Maori back in the 19th century. And they were trying to understand how the sail was constructed and why. They got into sailing on the seas again and canoes. But one of the things that she said is very interesting. She said that they began to have political discourse in Maori, to your point. That the language, again, is not simply a communicative tool. It's not just about saying, you know, Jumbo, which is, you know, kind of like saying hi, what's Sante, we're saying thank you. It's not just a communicative tool, but it's a tool that facilitates a way of seeing and being in the world, which has implications for our project, which is, yeah. Oh, it's more than that. It's, right. um, I'm going to talk about it here now. Uh, it structures how your nervous system is wired. Yeah, yes. how specifically. Yeah. And so it allows for type of expansion of some ideas and contraction of others, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or their elimination, mm -hmm. where you can't even conceptualize something. Mm -hmm. Because it's linguistically, it's psycholinguistically uh, not feasible. And so this, this idea, this the impact of language on our cognition, our conscious perception, is a part of what Rikeniani gets into. You know, she argues that, that language serves as a basis of Tendency and that reliance that the reliance of Africans upon European languages is not merely an indication of our failure to maximize the utility of our own language, but also that such a pattern betrays our belief in the willingness of the European world to carry African people in the future. You know, she argues that our very notions of futurity are linked to our dependence upon not just that language, but that culture, the entire view of reality. So having neither prepared ourselves for the possibility that we might be denied such passing, again, on the backs of Europeans. Whether Europeans might seek to actualize the future, it might be detrimental to African interests. Really, what Dr. Uh, 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 Professor Sox was talking about, we face a terrible malaise and needing to rely on us. So, so I'll put this image here. This is from Newsweek from Uganda. Uh, but you know, that could have been anywhere. It could have been down the street, you know. <laughs> um, because we are uh, seeking to link ourselves to the agenda of a particular people who, as far as they're concerned, as it relates to any future we have in relation to them, this is tools of facilitation of their dominion and nothing more. Um, so, so I put this image here. Some of you may, uh, you kind of agree that you may know what this is from. This is, um, you know, with, with all the hysteria now about the Black Panther. Um, then, you know, and again, this notion of futurity, uh, you know, many people argue that the film, the Black Panther movie, is situated in this discourse of Afrofuturism. Uh, I took this image actually from a comic, an older comic, the Black Panther Angel Number no. One. I think this came out in the late 2000s, written by Reginald Putnam. Mm -hmm. And I chose this one in particular because this is a story about the situation where Wakanda realized about five hundred years ago that Europeans were insane uh, in their, their, their attempt to dominate the world, and that Wakanda needed to intervene on behalf of black people as well as the world itself to save the world. And so in the story, they began to hatch this 500 year scheme. And by the time they get in the future, Wakanda is the preeminent nation on Earth. Uh, and so it's a very interesting story. Uh, but, but one of the things that is predicated on is this idea that uh, these, uh, these, African, these fictional African people in this fictional African country are uh, actually exercising uh, self-reliance to be able to rely on their own capacity and, and attempted to actualize their own vision of the future, not a vision of the future that's mediated by Europeans. And again, I, I don't say that in the abstract. I think that has very real implications because I argue that the European vision Maturity, but the future, or rather, European notions of maturity 
undergirds the vision of most black politicians on the planet Earth. You know, so whether we're talking about Ghana, Nigeria, Chicago, yeah. you know, New York, I would argue that most black political leaders are driven by a vision of the future consistent with the interests of the white folks. So, so what does the Ghanaian minister of war or right. of defense say with the U.S.? Right. They say, look, right. We're going in the same direction. We're going in the same direction. Same direction. Okay. Right. So then they cut a deal right. that allows the U.S. now to have military bases right. in um, Ghana. And you shelter to forces of empire. Shelter in the place. Yeah. That's amazing. So the last of, of these, these theories, these folks that talk about the problem, is uh, Super Tiani, uh, who's with the uh, White East from Chicago. And uh, what I like, and one of the things that, that, that is the, look, the, uh, the uh, motto of, of this school, which I choose, is this idea of Luga Ni Uchidami. So Luga Ni Uchidami, which is language is culture. Luga is language, Ni is ears. Uchidami is, is culture. So Luga, Luga Ni Uchidami, language is culture. And, and I think it's, it's highly appropriate in that it, it seeks to explain or unpack the deeper dimensions of the problem of language dependence particularly among those most estranged from their ancestral traditions. As you may see in this brother's artwork, I think this exhibit was at Dusabo, right? About four years ago, three or four years ago? It's called Ken Killing Ken, KKK. Uh, yeah, Ken Killing Ken. I think it was at the Dusabo. Yeah, about three years ago, maybe. Uh, Larry Crow, and I want to say uh, some folks that were connected with this, did a presentation of this in Dayton, Ohio, at the ASCAP Midwest Region Conference a few years ago. Uh, and there's a whole series of images of black folks uh, doing other black folks in. You'll notice the brother's baseball cap pointed at the top. Uh, and so the whole series is about the, the type of violence which occurs in our community. Uh, and, and, and the point, again, that the superchiality makes is that language is tethered to particular uh, cultural value. That in fact, the language facilitates that. Like one basic example, you know, most African languages, readings differ based on readings of situations. So you don't greet everybody the same way. Like uh, in, in, the, in the Swahili culture, uh, when you greet an elder, and you know, like you may greet your peers and just, you know, John Boy, and everybody, and you can greet the elders like that too, I suppose. But in a very formal context, you would say shikamo, you know, uh, and you would lower yourself when you go to greet them. I remember even seeing in this, in this context, people greet by the animals, you know, and they say shikamo and they, 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 they bend down. But this idea, and again, we're talking about the intergenerational discontinuity, the very language is a mediator of the type of cultural values in terms of people's respect, the elders, people's respect, the traditions. So that's just one example, and many of the others. But the point is that he argued that language is a bridge, you know, to connect our people to their traditions and to reconnect our people with a value orientation which we may need to, to get out of the situation. That we're in. So, so we're talking about the problems, now let's talk about the solutions. And, and this is where I, I lay out those four different things that people have proposed. Uh, the, the first, and I took the title, the Sema Kiswahili, Sema Kiswahili, Sema is speak, Kiswahili is Swahili language, Luka is in language, Yetu, uh, our. So Sema Kiswahili, Sema Kiswahili, Luka Yetu, so speak Kiswahili, our language. Kira Sima Tayari has a, a, a little book, a little yellow book called uh, Kiswahili, Luka Yetu, so I like, I like that, I think our language. Uh, so this is a uh, an engraving of uh, uh, Mombasa, the coastal city in Kenya from the year 1572. Um, I included this image because Kiswahili, again, of all the different proposals which have been made with respect to Pan-African languages, Kiswahili is probably the one that has the, the most historicity to it in terms of our struggle in the 20th century. Present. Um, and What's significant about Kiswahili, there's a wonderful book about this called uh, The Story of Swahili by Nade, uh, as the author's last name. He talks about the history of the language and argues that if we can go all the way back to the 12th century uh, and the commerce that was occurring along the Swahili coast, from what is today Somalia, all the way, southern Somalia, all the way to what is North Mozambique, traversing what is today Kenya, coastal Kenya. Coastal Tanzania, as well as the islands of Zanzibar. Now, this was a crossroads of trade. People coming from India, people coming from the, the Gulf states, and so on. Uh, and so, Swahili has positioned itself, even in, in the distant past, as a language of um, as, as a language that was used by many different people. The language of commerce, a language that interchanged interaction with people. That's why, when you look at the language, you find words from so many other cultures. Uh, and some people are, are very critical of that. 
But it also tells us something about the history of the language. So you find Farsi words, Arabic words, uh, you find Hindi words, you find uh, Portuguese words, German words, I mean, language is full of words from all these other places because of the interaction of all these people. Arabic influence inside It's just a lexical influence, so it's just words. So the grammar, the like, and so people like, there's, there's some people argue that like the language is in the grammar, but the structure of it is purely Bantu. So, so it's a part of a family of languages called Bantu languages, grammar, basically how the language works, how it's built, it's, it's pure Bantu, but, but it has many different words from other languages. So, so the Arab influence is significant in terms of words. In fact, if you look at the influence of foreign words, I think the Arabic influence is greatest. Uh, and so like, uh, what's an example of uh, Taifa? Uh, is the Arab, is nation. Uh, you probably know some people with Taifa in their name, right? But that's, that comes from an Arabic word, Malibu, uh, which comes from Elim, Malibu was teaching, Elim was, it comes from the book word, Elim was education, which comes from the Arabic word. Um, Kalamu, uh, uh, pen, writing instrument, comes from an Arabic word. Um, dunia, which is the word for world, the universe, also comes from Arabic. So it's a lot of Arabic words. Persian words like, uh, I think, Yota, no, Sayyadi. Sayyadi is the word for planet. That's a Persian word for understanding. Right? Um, what's another word? Uh, uh, Shule. Shule is a German word, obviously a German word, right? Um, what's another word? Portuguese, Mesa, the word for table, Mesa, that's a Portuguese word. So you have all these different, the Arabic influence is great. I was impressed by Van Sutherland in his documentation mm -hmm. showing the, uh, the language that was found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the writing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. tied into mm -hmm. the language there. Yeah, I mean, Rodney right, Kishwahili, what has made it attractive as a pan African language is that. What, one of the things that we see, again, people are cr critique the idea that you got all these small words in it. I propose that that's actually an advantage. Meaning that if you are, we already have, and talks about this, we already have a language that can get easily absorbed so that no matter what, what influences that you are absorbed, right? And so it's, it's a simple matter of us saying, let's say we want to use an African word to express, you know, teacher or planet. Or, or philosophy, or whatever it may be. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to utilize that within the existing framework of the language because it is its very nature. Um, it has a long history of being written. That also has, has some, some value. Uh, and again, again, it was a language of commerce. When Europeans colonized Africa, it eventually became a language of governance. So the Germans, the English were very much interested in using the language to tool of govern, governance because you had, you go to Kenya and Tanzania, you have all these different languages spoken by various ethnic groups, but you already have this language that's widely diffused. So even prior to colonialism, most people who spoke the language were probably not Swahili. There is a Swahili ethnic, but they're the, the, the minority. It's just, so it's kind of an anomaly. Well, well not anymore, English. Uh, so it's kind of, it may be an anomaly in many respects that, that the people who are the primary speakers of the language, being members of the ethnic group, are actually a minority among the broader range of speakers. So, but, but in the context of colonialism, you had many Pan-Africanists who looked at this and said, hey, we should use this language about it. Because now I can speak to you, and I can speak to you, and I can speak to you. And then over here, you know, we also embrace the language. And I think it was because of the, the Pan-African character. Uh, because of our own situation, you being descended of many different people. Well, how do you pick a language when you are constituted of many different people? So, so a language that in fact is shared by many people became very attractive. So this image is uh, an old image from the Shuli Awatoto. There's a... Young Baba Hannibal, a uh, relatively young Baba Hannibal uh, in Angolia. Uh, and then I use that, I'll just offer this as an example of how this language was fully embraced by black folks during the black power. We have never, Africa has more languages and more ethnic mm -hmm. the Right. Right. But that's been part of the problem. <laughs> What's that? More they language. had too many languages, they couldn't communicate with each other. And, and, and so, and that's part of why many people argue, and that's even that from the course, he's taken that argument also, that he's why he serves to facilitate person. Look at what's happening right now with East Africa organizations. You know, you find, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe at this point, every state that's part of East African organizations embraces Kiswa Hilly as a national language. So, so like you say, you got, I think Uganda and Rwanda the most recent. So it's they didn't uh, in, abandon. Uh, the, the, the language of the largest ethnic groups in that country, they also still have national language, but they put Kiswahili alongside. So Kiswahili, in exactly, has served a very powerful role in terms of regional integration.
The problem in some respects is that we don't have a similar phenomenon in West Africa. And in that, you know, there may be a lot of reasons behind that. Uh, but, but to your point, that's part of our mind's point, that, that that may be part of our language problem, that we don't have, I mean, we can see very much that language problem is being solved in East Africa, uh, not so much in West Africa. Now, one of the proposals, actually, two of the proposals made by the system, is that these are, uh, these are I don't know if this is just an example, of all the ways this language is diffused among black folks in the 60s and 70s. You know, I mean, these words became deep names, you know, people call their organizations these things and these readings. So you have words like Tayani, which is ready, Maisha, life, more Africa, Africa, uh, Moja, Unity, could you try to live self determination? Could you take a man self reliance? I think the uh, Julius Nyere, uh, in Tanzania, one of the models of the education system was a lingual, uh, lingual yeah, could you take a man which education and self reliance? But the Shuli also uh, uses also a Taifa nation, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is actually the word means begin. So if I were to say, uh, uh, Tunaanza, uh, Tunaanza Kula, which is we will begin, to, we are beginning to eat, we are starting to eat. I, I'm, the root of this word is Anza, it means to begin. But, but the African American holiday Kwanzaa is based on this word, but it's an extra A. But, but Kwanzaa by itself just means beginning, or to, to begin. Chile Yawa Toto literally school for children. Uhuru Sasa Shule out of Brooklyn. Uh, Uhuru Freedom Sasa now Shule School. Uh, Haki, true, Safisha, Cuba, G2 Giant, Malaika, Angel. Again, all of these words became a part of, of the lexicon within the Black Power era. And even today, I'm just in the last decade, it's been fascinating to me. There were several mothers who expressed an interest in me in like, using African language with their child. And, and they didn't ask about Twi or Yoruba or Wolof. They asked about this language. So even now, Kishwahili occupies a great deal of, of the, the African American imagination in terms of how we think about it, what we think of when we think about African language. Yeah, and here uh, while Dr. Bobby Wright, students and officials, uh, officials uh, he ended um, most of his writings with the Emilia Continuum. Mm -hmm. It was. Yep, yep. Yeah. Right here. Yep. Yeah. Two just seen the Emilia Shaka. We were conquered without a doubt. So, uh, and again, it's just a map uh, showing, you know, the, the East Africa, the, the, the zone where the language is, exerts its greatest influence. Uh, and it appears, and it, it spread. Um, and, and what's interesting also, as, as, it, as it spreads, again, because of the fluid nature of the language, it's changing. Um, like, you know, one, one example is that uh, Ugani talks about how in Congo, the language has a, uh, a class system, like all the bachelor languages have a noun class system, they have 18 noun classes. And so verbs, prepositions, adjectives all have to agree with the now what are we adjectives, prepositions, and conjunctions. Uh, and in Congo, they, they've been changing this. So they're following the rules of language, but they're bending the rules based on their own situation. And so the language is, is expanding and it's, it's sort of changing to adapt to those different places. But the point is that one of the things that, that I think is that, that I think that some people have argued has facilitated the spread of Kiswahili is its perceived neutrality. People perceive it as a neutral language. Uh, which was fascinating to me, like when I was, you look at Nigeria, many people argue that Nigeria should adopt a African language as its national language, but there's a lot of opposition to that because people don't tend to perceive the major ethnic languages in Nigeria as neutral. Plus, if here's the dilemma because people are stuck in their own ethnicity, mm -hmm. if you adopt one, right, right, then the other groups feel alienated exactly. just by the mere adoption right. of it, and so. Right. There has to be, as you say, a neutral piece right. that, you know, that's, com I mean, Swahili is strong. I used to speak it way back in the mm -hmm. military days. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of us that spoke it. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, I think at some point, just me personally, mm -hmm. I think that the Africans need to take their brain power and construct something that may have a Swahili baseline mm -hmm, to it, mm -hmm. but it's accepting of other dialects mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. Swahili is a trader's language. It all, that, that's part of its history. It's not to deny mm -hmm. that there weren't solid African points of origin, right. but when you talk about Arabic, a lot of Swahili has Arab notions mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. because it was a trader's language, particularly when you're talking about slavery. Mm -hmm. The Arabs would communicate using that trader's language. That, mm -hmm. that, that may be the reason that 
it's spreading mm -hmm. because it was used for commerce, mm -hmm. but it's also a trader's language, mm -hmm. okay, a, a slaver's language. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that, you know, at some point, I just think it has to be something that's created mm -hmm. utilizing the continent's mm -hmm. power. And I'm not saying that's an easy job, yeah. but I just think that, you know, because then what do you do about the Arabic? And right. all the Africans who are Muslims, right. okay, who, and the traders who use this language mm -hmm. as a means of generating commerce. So, so one of the proposals, you know, so if we, if we take, if we, like, if we take that idea, right, let's say we project, we extend it beyond this, this East African confines into West Africa, for instance. One of the, so there are things which will facilitate that, but there are things which, which are challenges, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things which is facilitative of that is that for many of the groups that have been Islamicized, Learning much of the vocabulary would actually be easy, would be expedited for them because some of the words are already there. So, Wula, uh, the Fula languages, and House all had like Dumia. That word is in all those languages. Uh, Kalamu is Kiswahili, Al Kalami is Hausa. Uh, that's another one I was fascinated by. Uh, but the point is that uh, a lot of that vocabulary, shared vocabulary, for many of the folks, especially the folks in the Sahel, that region that's south of the Sahara, so many of those folks. It might actually, just in terms of the vocabulary, it might be a relatively easy earth transition. The grammar, though, is, is, is probably what differs the most because where it has the map of similarities with languages here, uh, you, you could make the argument the grammar is pretty different from, from the grammar, grammatical structures of those other languages. The other problem is that there's no institutional base for the language yeah. in the West, uh, in West Africa, uh, whereas in East Africa, that's there. Uh, so that, that becomes a challenge. Um, so, so and that's right what I say right here. You know, the language, though it is expanding, it's not firmly entrenched in West Africa. But when I was in Ghana, I saw a couple of interesting things. Mm. You know, the taxis in Ghana all had messages in the back window. That was a taxi I saw that had Nzuri. In fact, Nzuri is good. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was so cool. I wanted, I wanted to, like, you know, I was in another taxi, so I couldn't ask. But if I had a chance, I wanted to be like, um, And then there was in a cry. I remember someone seeing a sign for some bookstore in the sign. Advertise the bookstore in a key Swahili name. And so, it's, so there's some kind of, you know, we know there's some key Swahili presence in West Africa, certainly not as is in the West, in the East, rather. Uh, and so, if we were to talk about key Swahili as a pan African language, institutionalizing the language in West Africa would be a challenge. The other challenge is this whereas diaspora <coughs> Africans in the United States embrace key Swahili, did that happen in Cuba? Did that happen in Brazil? And so, that actually raises some interesting questions also. So, key Swahili is a pan African language. Whereas if the idea has some traction among black folks in this country and folks in East and parts of Central Africa, that idea may not have that same traction outside of those zones. And so dealing with that challenge, you know, was something we'd have to look at. You know, there are other proposals. Some people have argued we should pick regional language. Uh, one one mob model, for instance, the more ways that what this could look like is that in West Africa, you think house, this is a map of the diffusion of the house of language. The, uh, the dark blue dark areas are places where people speak uh, where they, are, they speak house as their native language, the light blue areas are places where they speak it as a second language, and then also the, the light blue also people uh, who speak it largely as a second language but for part of the Muslim community. Uh, so Hausa is pretty widely diffused. Uh, if, if you look further, uh, if you look just to the west of there, the Mande language is diffused. And in this different Mande language, Mandinka and Bamana and so forth, to some extent, they're mutually intelligible. And if you also take this entire zone, you have a wide diffusion of the Fula language. Uh, and, and they have varying degrees of mutual intelligibility, meaning that a Fula speaker from Mali might be able to understand some of what a Fula speaker in Cameroon is saying, but they'll be significant. Uh, but, but the point is that we do see there are languages in West Africa which are multinational. You know, if you want to consider these nations, right? It's former colonies. Uh, House is one, Fula is another, the Monday language is a third, but they haven't yet gained the kind of traction like he's like he's why he was gotten this after. I think House, I think would conflict with Yoruba and Richmond. Right, right. Because right. most people in West Africa, Yorubas, they Yorubas and other uh, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters from that area, they look at houses as delivery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they would be thinking that they should step down. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in the south of Nigeria, this this idea has no traction. No, you do better from more Kiswahili than Nigeria. And the houses were slaves. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, at a certain level, all of these, the, the large yeah, states, yeah, all of the large yeah. states. 
They all got dirty hands. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. How, how do you see what you're saying fitting into the agreement supposedly with 22 countries mm -hmm. to uh, open up the trade. Africa. Right, right, right. So how does this fit? Yeah, they just they just signed something. United Africa, a yeah. compact yeah. trade yeah. agreement. Yeah. Except for two countries, Nigeria and, uh, Kenya. and Kenya. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So so what I, what I would say is that I think that the the, the significance of, of like, again, we already see these Africans, people see Kiswahili not only as a language, Again, that's communicative too, but something which is facilitated for commerce. And so I would argue the same is true in this country. Mm -hmm. This is why they're, they're never posed in Ghana, that. right? Making French require a secondary school to get a facility commerce. You get a map, Ghana. Do you see it? I guess I go, go back to the other map. Uh, Ghana is surrounded by French speaking countries. That's right. Burkina Faso to the north, Cote d'Ivoire to the west, yeah, Togo so to the east is surrounded by French speaking countries. So, from an integrated integration standpoint in terms of the regional economics, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the, but, but one might argue that an African language would be better because the diffusion, right? I mean, the diffusion among the people may be greater. And so again, you could very easily see another model where we talk about, yeah, even just one major language in the region, right? If you look at West Africa, it's so weird, I can understand where the, you know, Yoruba and the Igbo are coming from in terms of their preference for their language. The fact of the matter is that the diffusion of that language is a lot less than say, Fula or Hausa or Mande. Uh, this is another map. This is part of that the Lima approach, the regional approach. This is from a Yoruba textbook from the University of Texas. Basically, the yellow areas are what they identify as the Yoruba speaking world. So you have Nigeria, uh, you have that's Benin, uh, that's uh, Sierra Leone, Brazil, Cuba, uh, Trinidad, South Carolina. You, know, you have all these communities of folks where there's some traction where the Yoruba language has some traction. So some people argue that rather than picking one, you should just pick a, a, a finite number of languages. You know, maybe three, maybe five. And that's probably a very practical way of thinking about this. Because like I said, whereas we embrace Kiswahili to some extent in the 1960s, I don't think these folks did. You know, but, but Yoruba has traction, it's institutionalized to varying degrees. You know, Yoruba cultural practices. It's really just a matter of wedding the language that to, to, to a great degree. So in some ways, that the regional piece may be better, and, and, and also uh, it may help in terms of, again, facilitating commerce. Uh, some people argue for constructive languages. This is Armand's latest book, The Resolutionaries. One of the points that he makes in that book is that rather than dealing with all of these languages, we should just get a bunch of black folks together, and they should make a language. There you go. This has actually been attempted twice, as far as I know. There was a brother in the late 1960s named Otto Brock, uh, who in 1967 who created a language called El Afrihili. What he did for Afrihili is he took parts of different African languages. So if you look at it, and I, I started compiling a lexicon, like a dictionary of the Afrihili language, but I haven't finished it, I actually need a team to work on it. But like some of the words will be very familiar to you if you don't need these languages. The word for, for uh, nice is Zuri. Where does that come from? It comes from Kiswahili. The word for good is papa. Where did that come from? That's Khan. Yeah, that's from the Akan. Either, either, either uh, tree or war fine tree. Yeah. Fine tree. yeah. Uh, the word for uh, new is sabo. So it has all of these words from different African languages. So his idea was to create a really a pan African language. Uh, and who is that now? Akumi. His name is uh, K A Kumi Atobra. K A Kumi Atobra. And it's hard to find, but you can get the manual where he lays out the, the language. Uh, I have a copy of it. What? Uh, but it's a proposal that never caught on. I mean, because before I mentioned, had any of you heard of Af uh, African? So the, the proposal never caught on. The attraction, the attractiveness of a constructed language is not only that it can be pan-African in terms of how you build it, but it's also you can design it to make it easily learned. Use like it. I've right, I've studied Kiswahili as an undergrad. And I can't speak it fluently even now, you know, because it's, it's not, the grammar is, is kind of complicated. The grammar is relatively complex. And also, I'm in this alien environment, right? So there's not a whole lot of incentive to walk down the street speaking this way. Um, see. I just wanted to point out, and I can, there's a brother here, mm -hmm. um, now he lives in Oak Park, who, from his, um, source code computer programming, that is using the old IBM assembler language, mm -hmm. which then 
you know, go to the next level, Fortran, mm -hmm. or whatever. He created a language oh, that's interesting. out of that. Mm -hmm. From that as a basis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to communicate um, science concepts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say, well, I don't think he would claim that it's an African mm -hmm. quote language. Mm -hmm. It didn't come out of an African experience. Right, it right. came out of his computer programming experience. Mm -hmm. There may be some value to that. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, I find Atto Bra's approach interesting. And there's another brother uh, from Nigeria, uh, even new guys, who created a language called Bossa. And uh, he used a similar approach. And in fact, at, at an earlier stage in the language, he, he was taking, I'm trying to remember how he did this, the parts of speech came from different languages. So I want to say like verbs came from house and nouns came from like Igbo, Yoruba, and the opposite. So there's a, now he's, he's drawing from a wider range of West African languages. And so he's trying to push it as a West African language rather than as a continental language. But again, one of the advantages of this, of a, creating a language is learnability. We can make a language that, that's easy to learn. Like if you look at the State Department, it keeps data on how many hours it takes to learn a language. And like Arabic, it takes like thousands of hours to learn. Um, I think French is like probably a third of that. Uh, there's this, this Chinese. Yeah, Arabic. right, then Arabic, yeah. You know, so, so one of the ideas is that you could, you know, you could create a language that's relatively easy to learn, that's grammatically simple. Um, like one of the things in the book is really funny because you have this, this team that's talking to each other. And so they say, that, you know, we're going to eliminate all the GDs and the KPs and the clicks. Oh, because you have many of these sounds in African languages that, that uh, people who don't speak those languages may struggle to say, like when I was in Ghana, because Shui is a tonal language, there were certain vowels I had a hard time pronouncing. You know, and so they say, look, we can eliminate all of that stuff. This language is accessible. And so again, it's, a, it's an idea that has been proposed, but it's not a perfect solution. Yes, sir. We're all the uh, different languages play in the discord in Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. Um, many, and you see this, so Nigeria, Cameroon, right? The argument essentially has been, and this is the argument that people make regarding Tanzania. And really, it's not just the Tanzania, the context of Tanzania, the abstract, but also Jews here. That by having a national language, by integrating the national identity and making a part of that a common language, you're creating the system of national identity, overriding mm -hmm. what do you have to call micronationalism. And so one might argue that if we look at a Nigeria, you got to find many robust micronationalisms. Uh, and I don't mean like micronationalisms that just emerge within the context of the post-colonial era but things which also feed that from the pre-colonial era to, to Baba uh, Lindsay, right? Those long memories of who got put on the boat and by you know. Did you just say by he, he talked about this idea of micro-nationalism. He argued that our, our willingness, that our unwillingness to embrace languages which would be, be used by a wider community of African people was basically micro-nationalism. You know, that we're concerned about our, our little group of 10 billion, and then one and a half billion of us on here. Uh, and and his, his point essentially, and we see this the proof of this today. Micronationalism can't save African people. Pan African nationalism, I'm not arguing, can. But micronationalism can't enable us to create economies which can resist what we have to do. Not wrong. Because in the micronationalist context, we continue to be vulnerable to the Chinese and the British and the Americans and the French. In the pan African context, we actually have a structural capacity in our community that can resist. So to that point, with respect to a place like Ghana and Nigeria, well, not Ghana, so more, most of Nigeria. The, the problem is that you have many different ethnic goals. You see, Diop would call that micronationalism. And, and his argument or proposal was that we might be able to use language to overcome that. Now, Nigeria, again, then it goes to the question, right? Could we utilize the Nigerian language to overcome that? Probably not. In fact, I was reading the book when I was writing this paper. And the author argued that one of the things that happens when you, when you begin to promote any particular language is that there have to be aspects of the language that makes it attractive. The language has to be connected to a broader political economy, that's English and French, right? The language has to be connected to a particular sense of historical identity. So, so for, for, for African people in this country embracing Yoruba and Swahili, again, this is the idea of an African identity embedded in the language. Uh, or the language has to be connected with a particular conception of a grand, a grand vision of history, right? So for, the Yoruba, you know, um, 
the, the historic state of Oyo, the Oyo Empire, even though all the people weren't part of Oyo, but Oyo becomes emblematic. You especially see this in Ghana with the Ashanti. Yeah. But yeah. just a language. No. It's, it's, it's the language of I, I didn't want to bring yeah. that up, but I could just imagine right. the Ashantis right. dropping tree, a Shanti tree right. for Kiswahili. Oh. I'd like to see that. And so, so the point is that the the, the challenge, I think, from Biak's point of view, with the Nigeria is that the salience of micro nationalism and the absence of a, a broader pan African consciousness to facilitate the Nigerian language. And again, that's part of why this proposal is more side. You know, he, his idea, this is what Scott was saying, that this might be attractive to people because it's something that embraces that depth of your existing person. And again, now again, you know, our, our notions of futurity are colonized by Europeans, so I don't even know if this is palatable to most people. Even no. though you can make this facilitative of all of the different languages in which we are presently situated as our people. I, I think that uh, your, your concept is. Excellent because it goes to the heart of the problem. Mm -hmm. But once again, I think that that's like putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in my estimation, we have to conquer all those people. Then we can create the language and say, hey, this is how we're going to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, mm -hmm. they're not going to give up their mm -hmm. micro nationals mm -hmm. mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they are. In Scots, mm -hmm. but power make you get just yeah. like they speak French, <laughs> just like they speak English. Yeah. It's because of power. Yeah. We got to create a force mm -hmm. to take mm -hmm. the land. Mm -hmm. Then we can say this is what we gonna speak. Mm -hmm. And if you go and get some bread, if you can't say this word bread, you ain't getting them. And I'm telling you, everybody gonna learn. <laughs> And that, that's true. That. I, 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 uh, I got one, so I got one question I want to ask you. And that is, well, I'm referring, referring to, to, oh, thank you. I'm going to use you. you, you uh, I'm referring to, <laughs> to the article that you sent us on African uh, common uh, commerce, uh, yeah. unification of Africa. Mm -hmm. How can you have a, a, an African? EU style uh, unification without a common language. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. Well, a United States of Africa without a common language. But I think I think I I agree with you mm -hmm. on one hand, but I think that as they deal with these pronouncements, because that's what I feel that that's mm -hmm. was a, it's a pronouncement, mm -hmm. we're going to have an openness, that and the other. I think that over time, they have to address certain problems in every area to make that notion real, mm -hmm. okay? And, and it's kind of like putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse because where do you start? Okay, they started with the idea. Mm -hmm. Now they got to have brain power to figure out how they're going to work that. And that's one of the issues that the people from Nigeria stated and the people from Kenya is like, okay, how you gonna do this? Mm -hmm. Let's see mm -hmm. how y'all gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh just one other thing. Mm -hmm. I think Naria was correct to set up Kiswahili as a national language, as part of a national identity. Because what it said is look, we need to rise above these ethnic divisions that mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's a struggle because now Naira is not there mm -hmm. meaning the people who were with Naira so the elites are saying well we want to buy into the bigger world mm -hmm. so that's the dilemma right. which goes back to Jack's notion of sustainability right, right. it's right. one thing to have the idea How? but then you got to have a force that drives the idea okay mm -hmm. which is from my viewpoint Power, mm -hmm. okay, the crook and the slave, mm -hmm. Pharaoh's authority, power, mm -hmm. but also his responsibility. So, if we have the responsibility for the mm -hmm. language, we have to have the power to mm -hmm. drive the language because it legitimizes so, legitimize it, the language. And validate it, right. right. reinforce it, and right. say, You ain't hip to that, right. where you been, right. so that it becomes popular within mm -hmm. the various cultures, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. among the young people, right? Because young people. I won't say they're not wedded to traditions they are, mm -hmm. but when something new comes, they want to try it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas the older people, it might be another, another thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, 
something has to drive mm -hmm. the notion, mm -hmm. push it forward, make it move, make it real, make people dialogue it, discuss it, debate it, argue it, mm -hmm. uh, don't argue it, whatever. Something has to drive that. that. Yeah. And, and, and that to me is power. What I want to say is two points. Uh, the film, The Black Panther, I'm not going to get into discussion of films, but there's two points I want to bring up related to what you're saying, is that is the reaction. Mm -hmm. Continental Africans, they don't, they, they um, say this with a level of condescension. Mm -hmm. They don't they resent that an African American quote mm -hmm. wrote the film. That's true. Directed the film. That's true. And an African American played T'Challa. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they don't like the idea, going back to the micronationalism mm -hmm. piece, mm -hmm. of these two African Americans creating this pastiche of symbolic African ideas mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. because it didn't account for them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you take uh, the language in Savili, mm -hmm. in Savili mm -hmm. from Nigeria, mm -hmm. for example. From South Africa. No, 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 from no, Nigeria. no, no, it's from a, Nigeria. In northeastern Cameroon. Right, right. near yeah. Cameroon. It's, yeah. really Which one? It's, it's a symbol. It's, 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 it's a, in Savili. Yeah, it's a symbolic, it's yeah. an iconography, it's a system okay. of iconography along okay. the evil and other folks in that region. Okay, all right. The, and they're popularized now as a cool. But I thought, thing. okay, I'm sorry, I thought it's, they pulled the Delic piece, but anyway. Well, they right. did. Okay. Uh, um, but go ahead, speech, honey, I don't want to get into The speech, point. yes. Okay. And so, West, East Africans in Kenya right. and West Africans, in Ghana, Nigeria, presented the fact that this brother had used speech from South Africa. Right, okay, all right. That's what I was saying. What I'm saying. The South African piece. And a symbolic language from West Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Why did they do that? And so I'm saying. Uh, my dear brother, is that this is going to be the backlash right, right, right. should any African American attempt to uh, create another language. Right, right, right. But, but one of the things I'm going to add on to what you said, the flip side of that is, is that many of the African countries, particularly Ethiopia, said, that's us. That Wakanda is us. We no, were there. No, yeah. No. I know what you're saying. I read yeah. the article. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Wakanda. I'm really, saying that's what they claim. No. Stan Lee said here in Chicago, a corner place, the basis for the Black Panther was what happened in the Congo. By mm -hmm. bringing right. in what you reign in. Right. right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denying that, Hunter. What I'm saying is, is that the continental wow. Africans across Africa yeah. bought into the notion of Wakanda. Okay, yeah, each claiming it, there. claiming it as theirs, as their own, as their own. As their own. That's all exactly. I'm saying. That's all You're I'm right. saying. So I'm not they, saying it's real, <laughs> but I'm saying they claimed it as their own, and I think that that's important, even Absolutely. though they may be resentful of the fact that African Americans put it together. But at the same time, they claiming it as their own countries. Okay, right. and I think that that's an important idea. That's all across Absolutely. the continent. Right. Okay. What would happen if, if uh, Gaddafi had been able to follow through with his effort to unify us through the banking system? Would that have, have influenced the possibility of this one language that we would be using? No, that would have been a catastrophe. Uh, it's good on paper, but you still got an Arab running the show. <laughs> and he's speaking Arabic. That was his native language. So we would have been in the same predicament with a different master. I, I totally disagree. That goes back to my piece that I did on uh, Black Panther. That last issue is what happens when our liberator doesn't look like who we think it should look like. Well, we ain't going to be liberated. Well, the, no, I, I disagree. 
We ain't gonna be. We don't. We, 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 we can't. We can't be liberated by someone that don't look like us. I wasn't. I was talking about music. Go ahead, Cam. Finish up, right. and then we'll go to the next person. That's how I that, right? So, the European Economist magazine, which is the leading European paper, economic paper oh, in yes. Europe, yeah. comes yeah. out of London yeah. and says yeah. that if yeah. the African yeah. yeah. went to a single yeah. gold back country, oh, it would destroy yeah. every European economy. Oh, no. That's present on the planet at this time. Now, if we destroy the European economies globally, that gives Africans, no matter who issues that, who brings that into play, that gives Africans an opportunity to liberate ourselves, to create the type of societies and governments we desire, if we're not beholden to this European currency. So when our liberator doesn't look like who we think it should be, we want to just shun liberation. We want to stay shackled. I want to say suggest this to you, Brother Cam. The European economy is not going to be disrupted by some maneuver with money. It's only going to be disrupted by force. They took the world by force. They will give it up by force. Well, That's I, all. That's all it is to it. I wasn't suggesting that Arabic you know, would be that language, but Swahili mm -hmm. would be the language used in, in the new monetary system that he was proposing. That's what was proposed? No. Okay. He, he proposed, and it's a good idea, of a common currency, a common economic denominator amongst the Africans. Yeah. And all I'm suggesting is that was good, and Hillary and them killed him, but the European Union or Europeans aren't going down without a fight. Yeah. That's all it is. I think. They ain't going down without a fight. They showed that. I think the idea, and I don't think we really have a disagreement. Let's just put the power piece in here. If we have power, then you have influence. Then right. you can compel, or at least you can sit at the table and you can dialogue and you discuss on what you have. And you have the capacity to render consequences, which means that people have to respect you when you come to the table. So that means they have to respect your idea. It don't mean that you, they have to like it. Doesn't mean that they're not going to try to undermine it. Doesn't mean that they're not going to try to destroy it. It just means that they have to respect it because you exist and because you have the power to sustain it and to advance it and make it do what it needs to do. That's struggle. We keep talking about things, but we have to talk about struggle. We have to talk about power. Because even with this, you're going to knock book publishers. You're going to knock government printing. There's just a wide range of things that the practicality of language deals with that's going to be life changing, technological changing, even how you do technology. Right. All of that's going to change. Remember what Bobby used to tell us? He said, Look, if you get a typewriter in Africa, it changes the whole way that African people live. We're talking about an electronic typewriter. Why? Because you got to have electricity to run the typewriter, right? Sure. Then somebody got to know how to do the typewriter. So I'm just saying we got to have power at the end of the day. There has to be some type of power, some type of force, some type of consequence that can be put on people to respect our notions of what we need to do. And if we don't have that, then their ideas, their ideals, which are okay, because we got to have them so that we understand what the power is useful for. So the, uh, the last of the three proposals is this proposal of, uh, of Kisa of Metronesha as a Pan-African language. Uh, so, and, and so with respect to Metronesha, when we had the Metronesha conference in the fall, uh, the, uh, there were dealing primarily with the question of the revitalization of the language, which is a different question from the elevation of the language as a, as a, as a, as a Pan-African language. Those are, those are two different ideas. Um, I'm trying to change it. This is showing up on my screen. Uh, but some people have argued that the language is particularly valuable given its connection to African antiquity. Uh, Metonetra has the benefit of also having the type of neutrality that we accord Kiswahili. It's not the language of any living African people. Uh, it's also a language which has a, a very wide uh, literature. Uh, and, and so to that end, may be useful for capturing a number of different uh, ideas. So again, many people argue that, that uh, Metonetra 
as a, as a classical African language can value. One of the things that Sabah Rikiniyama talks about, she argues that the language, you can't read this, I'll read it out, she argues that the language may be useful in terms of capturing ideas. So this is a Facebook post for us, she says, uh, this federation word is the foundation of the genetic world view to culture. It, its meaning is complete, yet basically it means harmonious balance, truth, and right living, doing, speaking. The feather is the primary symbol. The more I see my book, I assume it's like so this is the word behind this is it written in the uh, This this uh is called trilateral makes the sound ma. This is the bilateral makes the sound ma. This is the ah sound. So, so some of these what happens you put um you have a phonetic uh, phonetic complements. So you'll have sometimes over the right a word a symbol that makes a sound that's in the previous symbol twice. But it's basically ma. This uh feather is a term that symbolizes ma. This scroll here is a, it's a, it's a determinant of what's left off. It's an abstract noun uh, that the knowledge also has. It's implicit, though, it's an abstract noun, and it a mark of the plurality. Uh, but Ma'at, again, is this ideal from uh, Kenneth, you know, depicted as a woman, and Ma'at is a mesh red, it's this principle, this female principle of divinity. But, but the point is that one of the things that Lemonetra gives us, and I argue, many, you know, any language potentially gives us this. And this is also part of the, the, the issue that we face when we get languages. Like words, by their very nature, are tethered to the culture out of which they come from. They, they you know, they, they mean, the meaning is inextricably linked to the culture in which they are conceptualized. One of the problems that we face, and we don't bother really talk about this a lot, we often bring this notion, these assumptions of equivalency to our engagement with, with language. And, you know, so we want to know what is the African word for this? When in fact that idea may not even exist within that cultural reality, right? Uh, and then, so one of the things that Ma'at did it gives us a very comprehensive notion of, of, of correct of correct behavior. In fact, Ma'at is probably for me a very fascinating idea because it articulates this idea of behavior of order, not only on the interpersonal level, meaning how we interact with people, but even on the cosmic level. You know, so when you read the cosmologies. You know, they talk about how the, the very formation of the universe itself is situated within uh, Ma'at. And, and so you have, we have some people, they would, they would reduce Ma'at just to, to the idea that Ma'at is a comedic paradigm of ethics. And indeed it does represent, you know, this is comedic paradigm of ethics, but it's more than that. It's just bigger than that. That would be sort of like putting this big concept into a little big box. And so what it reveals, you know, what, what it suggests is that Ma'at offers a more expansive framework for understanding the comedic worldview. And this is illustrative of how languages can be very powerful in terms of how they connect us with these ideas. Um, you know, one of the things that Dr. Brothers talked about in his book, Dr. Nesh, says, listen to the way we, you know, we need African champions. You know, we break the chains between African ideas and European ones, and also who ultimately position us to listen to the voice of our ancestors without European interpreters. And, and so this idea of language connecting us to that way of deep talk that we talked about, you know, and then the language, more than any other African language that gives us that access, is metamorphic. Uh, not that other African languages don't contain deep thought, because they all do, uh, but the antiquity of phonetic thought also makes it profoundly meaningful. And some people have argued, again, we should not only revive this language, but we should also consider making it an African language. You know, one of the things that I might talk about in that essay, uh, language problem, talked about how in the metamorphic language we have because of the vastness of vocabulary, we have many terms that we can bring to bear in living African languages today. And I've, I've thought about that even with respect to Kiswahili, because again, if people are, are talking about the presence of these Farsi and Arabic words, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a sense of a challenge to also bring African words in from other living African languages that can facilitate that type of being. So one of the things that Dr. Brother says in uh, one of his essays is that our terminology should be permeated with phonetic phrases and words. Uh, and he ultimately suggested that, you know, metamorphic would be useful, and not only in terms of our work, in terms of revitalizing the African worldview, but also reorienting our, reorienting our consciousness of these words uh, can, can really facilitate, to, to your point, Bob Hunter, a different way of thinking and perceiving. And that's is something that one of the, the scholars of uh, metamorphic, one of the teachers, but actually Montgomery talks about is how the language is facilitated of a different type of cognition. Uh, because languages, again, convey a particular worldview. So, in conclusion, um, and well, well, not in conclusion, one of the last things that I think may also be an asset of metamorphic is that it has a script. Uh, and it is a script that is relatively neutral. 
You know, like when you look at the NCBD script, it's a wonderful script, but this is an example of it. There's a whole NCBD project where they're attempting to use it as a phonetic script. Uh, so traditionally, as far as I know, it was ideographic. Uh, ideographic means like this is ideographic, right? Which that symbolizes the heart. This is ideographic. It's not a sound, right? Uh, but there's an effort for now to make it phonetic, where each of the symbols represents a sound. And so now the idea is you can take it there and write. Ebo and other languages in it. So, so one of the words I just come across this this morning is this word Elu Allah, which is uh, can mean upland or hinterland. But, but on the map that they they have a map that they show and they use this for Africa, Elu Allah, which is basically upland. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So we actually that's one of the challenges. You know, many traditional African languages are where for Africa is basically African. Um, so one of the points that I argue is that we could actually use Swahili to write other African languages. And I, I do this myself. Um, and, and I know some other people that do it. So here's some, some key swahili and some tree words. Uh, this is, uh, let's see. Oh, this is, this is hulu, uh, hulu. So freedom, liberation. In key swahili, hulu, this is hulu. Uh, what is this? This is, uh, oh, this is one of my sadists, key swahili proverb. It's hakima ni mali, hakima ni mali, which is wisdom is wealth. Uh, this is, Oh, this is a just a statement I wrote. This one. This is Dunia, which is Earth. Ni is Sayat. Earth is a flesh. Uh, and then uh, the rest of these is tree. This is uh, put this together. I forgot what. Um, I know this is uh, Kabon, uh, Ma, uh, Kabon. Uh, which is uh, union and strength, basically union and strength. And, uh, well, okay, so you get the point, you know, you can write. We're gonna have a week, we can't mark tone, so that's, that may be attention. So in conclusion, uh, well, again, what I, what I tried to do in the paper is, is to understand the implications of language to African liberation. You know, again, I argue that, that language is a link, that it's not an abstract notion, that it actually is part of the terrain of struggle. So I'm not proposing, like, this idea that we get the language thing right, and then we go out to freedom land, and then we go out to the institutions, that this is, these, are, these are concurrent processes, that while we're also attempting to build uh, the political power base and economic base to liberate ourselves, that part of that decolonization of our consciousness, which is necessary, is also ultimately something which can be facilitated through language. Um, also offered a brief and critical analysis of some of the various proposals. Again, Kiswahili is a pan-African language, or a, 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 a different languages, a regional approach to language. If we take a language for this place, this region, I want the language for that region. Some people would propose that we create a language, which is a very interesting idea. One of the problems with that, I, that idea is something we which I didn't mention earlier, was the idea that I got from Dr. Poe. He says the problem with the artificial language is that it doesn't have a natural base from which it can expand. And that's true. When we look at the diffusion of Shanti Chui in Ghana, it's, a, it's emerging from a natural base, the diffusion of the Ashanti people, right? Yeah, they wherever are. they go, their language goes. And those are said this, that were in the strategic alliance. Exactly, exactly. Okay. You know, same thing with, with, um, with the Swahili language. You know, again, it's, it's diffusion is occurring for a range of reasons, political, economic, cultural. Um, if we make up a language, like we go and sit in our houses right now and make a language, we have to create a means, we have to incentivize people to learn the language. And what does that mean, given that people tend to learn languages that accrue some advantage to them, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, lastly, um, but we'll also, the, the, you know, there are a lot of issues that we have to address. Um, because I argue that beyond even the effort of us embracing any language of Pan-African language, there's also the matter of institutionalizing, making that language a part of our normal life. You know, meaning producing literature in that language, using it, using it in media, uh, making it a part of our institutions on every conceivable level. You know, there's a lot we can learn from other groups of people. There are a lot of people who they have uh, started this process, and and and, and you know, actually, you know, if you look at what happened in Hawaii. The first of the Punana Leo, which was the Hawaiian native language schools, opened in 1983, which is interesting, you know, because we have been, if you get 
cultural nationalism within the context of the Black Power movement. We're talking about roughly the mid 1960s, but we can say maybe it's broad diffusion, maybe the late 1960s. Uh, and then these folks started in '83. Then they have a network of schools from preschool all the way to college, uh, television, a television network, uh, literature, and so on. And so again, when when one is serious about the reclamation of one's culture, one makes things. And then, so again, I'm not saying that we should be like them, but this it's, is an interesting model to observe. But the point is, they got to grow it. Yeah. They know that. Yes. And so schooling yeah. is one way of schooling doing Schooling is definitely one way to do it. They have their own space. They have their own space. Right. We, we're, that's and they still yeah. got some of that cultural tradition yeah. oh, right. in a political movement. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you get part of the you know, thing that, that I argue we may look at, like the benefit of looking at these groups like the Mao, like the Dance Alliance, and others. You know, what dissemination strategies are they employed? Uh, how has their language campaign impacted their political discourse, economic development, and so on? Because I think these are things we can learn from. They're asking for their language back. Yeah, that, that's, that, and that's real. <laughs> that's real. <laughs> so, you know, and then lastly, you know, this is uh, Steve Jotty said, I think the essence, I think language is the essence of uh, that It's not just for communication, but it also embodies the people's world and people's life. And my point is that language is, 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 is ultimately facilitated with worldview and inherent with it, again, are our notions of futurity, our notions of where we see ourselves as a people, and what we, and what project we're attempting to develop in the world. So, uh, we're out of time, so I'll stop there and uh, open it up for uh, Maswali Na Manel. Well, I, 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 I think we had all the questions and answers know, right? in the debate, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep time from his piece, because we took in, uh, if somebody could be so kind to, to hit the lights, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rashid for coming here. And I think he did. And you know, it's interesting what he was discussing here, because Hunter, the last time we were around, he began to discuss this notion of language and words and utilization of that. And I think that that's an important piece to put into our notion. So without further ado, I want to give Brother Taiba if he would come in, if we could just welcome him and let him come in and do his piece. All right, Hotel, thanks for attending. Signing off. Sorry, we had to have our